Thank you so much for coming to our first in a series of speaker events sponsored by the Rhode Island chapter of the American Society for Public Administration and supported in large part by Roger Williams University's School of Justice Studies, the MPA and MS Leadership Programs in particular. Before we get started, I just want to acknowledge a few people in the audience. So when I call your name, please stand. First, we have with us the Dean of the School of Justice Studies, Eric Bronson. Dr. Michael Hall, who many of you know quite well, could not be with us this evening. He sends his regrets. He's in Albany. He had an appointment that he was unable to get out of. He really, really wanted to be here. So we're just going to send him some well wishes and some love. And I'm, I think he might even be joining us at some point online if he can. I'd also like to acknowledge the person who helps put all of our events together, Lee Koo. <laughs> Lee is also the secretary treasurer of our Rhode Island chapter of ASPA. So if you are currently not a member and are interested in becoming a member of ASPA or, who, or if you would like some general information, Lee is the person to see. I'd also now like to just, I'm going to say a few words uh, about him um, in length, but I do want to acknowledge our guest speaker for the evening, Dr. Ty Palermo, Taino, but I call him Ty. We all call him Ty in the, well, it was the former, formerly the School of Continuing Studies, but it's now Roger Williams University, University College. So I'll say a little bit more about Ty in a moment. But to begin our evening, I just want to um, tell you a little bit about our plans for the year with RIASPA. So as I mentioned, this is the first of our series. We, we always start in the fall with a reception for the members of ASPA to come together and our MPA students, leadership students, um, students in now University College and um, faculty, friends, community partners, and students um, in Roger Williams University in general in Bristol. So this is probably the largest gathering I think we have to date for this particular event. We like to start uh, with a mixer and it also gives us an opportunity to acknowledge um, our top students in the MPA program and MS leadership program from the previous academic year. So I'm going to, at this time, ask her, where did she go? Back there. Oh, there, okay. I would, I would like to have Karina Ramsett Short join me. So Karina was our top um, MS leadership student for academic year 2017-2018. And I think she finished the program with a 4.0, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Hard to talk. Um, and of course, we wanted her to keep coming back and be with us. So instead of giving you your award at the end of the academic year, we decided we would do it now. Uh, <laughs> so I want to present you with your award. But I'd also like, um, I'd like Dean Eric Ronson to join us. We're going to take a picture. Um, I would also like, um, who, oh, he's not here yet. I was going to say Paul Pavis was going to join us. He is a, a previous winner of this award in the, in the MS leadership program. So you're just going to have to suffice with me and Dean Ronson. <laughs> Properly aligned. 
for college, right? There you go. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. I know, I'm just saying it's one of the Okay. <laughs> So, so what Karina was actually presented with was the Dean's Award for Academic Excellence and Leadership. The award committee, uh, which consists of members of the Executive Council of RIASPA, also members of the MPA and MS Leadership, um, faculty and alums, basically got together to look through a variety of nominations and Karina was our award winner um, so uh, this award epitomizes all that all that we hope the leadership program um, strives for academic achievement commitment to leadership and outstanding potential in the public but also because it's a, a MS leadership program in the private or the nonprofit sector so basically all of the sectors combined so again congratulations Karina the next award that I want to present is um, was given in honor of John W. Stout, who was responsible for actually starting the MPA program. He had a he had a major hand in starting the MPA program on our campus. So um, Dr. Stout was the dean of the School of Continuing Studies beginning in 1991, and continued in that capacity until. I believe it was the spring of 2012. Am I right, Tracy, somewhere in that? Somewhere in that. Somewhere in that. So he was actually um, part of Roger Williams University for 44 years, and he was a member of the American Society for Public Administration for 48 years. So basically his entire career in academe, um, he was associated with the American Society for Public Administration and did a lot of work um, in that regard. We named this award in his honor because of his commitment to the public service, his, um, his efforts to actually get the MPA program started at Roger Williams University. He, along with some faculty members in the political science department, were instrumental in getting the program off the ground. So it was in 2006 that Dr. Hall dedicated the award in honor of his major uh, factor in bringing the PA curriculum and, and the pre PA program to Roger Williams University. And as many of you probably are aware, uh, Dr. Stout passed away this past September. So this is uh, especially meaningful this year to, um, to talk about his legacy uh, particularly as it relates to the public administration program here, the, the MPA program, and um, we're honored to have the award named after, after uh, Dr. Stout. So I'd like to, uh, Michael O'Brien to come forward. Michael? Michael was a 2017-2018 recipient of the John W. Stout Outstanding MPA Student Award. Um, and this award epitomizes all um, that we achieve, that we uh, strive for in the MPA program, academic achievement, commitment to leadership, and outstanding potential in the public sector. So I'd like to present the award to Michael. And we will stand Thank you. Thank you. 
things are going on. Okay, Ali, I did this out of order, but I'm going to do this now. Um, there, there are a few reminders that I'm, I am to give you. The first is, if you need to leave early, please leave through this side, the back doors. <laughs> it just says, okay, use the door behind the room. Back doors. Okay. Yes. Um, also, would you please silence your cell phones, <laughs> mobile devices or at least uh, so that they won't disrupt the program. She says, please put them on vibrate. <laughs> so please do that. And if you have not actually signed in, we would appreciate that you sign in. Uh, there were a couple sheets. We, if you pre-registered, we have your name, so it's just a matter of checking in. Um, if, you, if you didn't register, we still want you to sign in. And those of you who are in PA 512, federalism class. We do have class tonight. <laughs> so it, it won't, it, it'll be an abbreviated session, you know, just a little bit of maybe an hour, maybe a little less, depending on how long we go t tonight. As Dean, I gotta, you, you're serious? <laughs> <laughs> it's a double hall tradition. Yeah, I gotta go back and change this letter. <laughs> On, uh, so perhaps you'd like a holiday from the <laughs> no, Actually, I, I think some of you would are welcome having your first paper returned. And we don't have a lot to cover this evening. I've, I tried to, to get a short. However, considering we're on a hybrid format and we only really meet seven times in person, I did not want to miss an opportunity to have my in-person experience with all of you. So, um, so when we conclude, you know, we'll have a little bit of a break, you'll have a little bit of a break, and then, you know, find your way to room 232. I don't even know the, the number, I just know where to go. <laughs> okay. All right. Any other reminders, Lee, that you can think of that weren't on the... Oh, thank you so much. That's, uh, yes, it is right there. Um, you know, it's hard it is. Well, you know, normally I have like three by five cards and, and I'm like flipping back and forth, so I'm, I'm not as smooth as I normally would be. But it's okay, it's not, it's me, not you. Okay, uh, I would, we, the, before we um, started this evening, we had uh, a membership meeting of Ryan Aspa, and uh, I want to acknowledge the members of the executive council who the membership voted to be on the executive council. So would the executive council please stand, and then I will acknowledge each one of you. So Christopher Pierce. Sasha Zapata and George Labonte are here. They, they are, oh, and Aaron Chesky, <laughs> yes, of course. Um, they, they are your four council members. Um, we hold elections every, we just changed our bylaws, so it's every two, two, two yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of a rotating thing, so some will rotate off and, and others will rot rotate on. But I also wanted to give each one of the council members just a short opportunity to say, I know Chris wanted to talk a little bit about National ASPA, so he has a dual role. So he um, not only is uh, on the executive council for the local chapter, but he is also the student representative um, at the national level. So Chris, do you want to say a few words? I know you. Yeah, sure, I mean, I think it doesn't matter what order. If you want to go. Just come on up. Okay. All right. <laughs> I wrote everything down, so I should not forget. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Christopher Pierce. I am, like you said, on the executive council for uh, the RASPA, and I am currently serving as uh, the elected official for ASPA for a student representative. Uh, I just, just uh, I want to speak a little bit on ASPA, and uh, who's a member here? Raise your hand if you're a member. 
have about 40 cool. active members. Cool, so yeah, yeah, I see a lot of familiar faces. So, who's not a member? <laughs> All right, this <is> perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect. So, um, a little bit more about myself. I graduated the MPA program um, 2018, so fresh grad. Um, and a lot like you guys, I was in taking classes, signing the bridges, doing panoptos, all the wonderful things that, that we love about the program. Um, <laughs> and um, what, so becoming a, becoming a member of ASP is really easy. You, you can sign up online. Um, if you're a student, it's $50. It's a one year, one time fee. Um, if you're a new professional, it's 60. So it's very affordable. Um, but what you, what you get with it is, uh, wait, it's, it's, uh, you get a lot for that. Uh, one of the, one of our highlight programs that we do every, that we hold every year is this uh, program called the Founders Fellow. The Founders Fellow is a program with 25 selected academics practitioners and they're assigned a mentor and it's, uh, it's one of our headline programs at National ASPA. And we actually have two Founders Fellows here tonight. Uh, Dr. Hall's not here, but if you, if you guys have never been here before, Dr. Hall always says this spiel. Well, we have our first Founders Fellow, mm -hmm. <laughs> George Labonte. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're, we're shortly followed after um, George, George's footsteps, uh, Sasha Zapata, who was Founders Fellow of last year. So, being a member of ASPA gives you this opportunity to be part of this program uh, to gain professional development, connections, mentors, so many things that you can find on the website on National ASPA. Additionally, you get free webinars, e-webinars. Mm -hmm. So, they have e-webinars e on resumes and anything, a lot, a lot of things. And it's free for you if you just have to sign up. Um, I'm up here uh, because I am going to the mid-year meeting for ASPA next week regarding my section of the population of ASPA, which is student and new professionals. So they're asking me uh, on feedback on what ASPA is currently doing, what they're doing well, and what they can improve on. So I'd love to talk to any of you um, later regarding anything that you find in those things I just said. Um, additionally, we have our national conference coming up in March um, in Washington, D.C. So it's, it's a little hop and a skip plane run up from here, so it's not too, not too bad. Um, it's an invaluable experience, uh, the connections, yeah, the the presentations, all the, everything, it's a, it's a fun conference and very informative. Uh, I hope to see you there. Feel free to talk to me about anything ASPA related and I will be glad to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we, we are unique in that we're such a small chapter, um, but we have two Founders Fellows uh, and we actually have a couple of people that have applied, I believe. Uh, I won't mention who they are, but um, so we're hoping to continue the tradition and may maybe have another Founders Fellow from Rhode Island um, to join the, the national ranks. Um, so congratulations. And, and we also are the only chapter in the country that has high school students as part of ASPA. And that's very unique, but we work, um, this chapter works every year with two schools from uh, Pawtucket, Tolman High School and Shea High School. So we actually develop the curriculum for them to follow throughout the school year. And then at our culminating <coughs> event in May, they do either posters or presentations about the work that they did. Our theme this year is civic engagement, or I actually I prefer community engagement. Um, and so they're gonna be talking about how their schools and the work that they do in their communities connects um, the public sector, the nonprofit sector, and the private sector. 
and the need for sectors to work together to strengthen schools and, and education. So we're looking forward to the, our high school students and their presentations. So um, I mentioned that our theme this year is civic engagement, community engagement, and we couldn't think of a better speaker than our very own Dr. Taina Palermo, um, who has done such outstanding work in our community to develop policy, to bring community partners together, to partner education and nonprofit organizations and the public and the private sector working together um, to really look at all of the intractable problems that we have, but to look at them in a positive way, to look at them to say that together we can solve problems as opposed to looking at them and saying they're, they're intractable and there's nothing that can be done. I don't want to steal too much of his thunder because I think what, um, what Ty is going to do tonight is basically walk you through his journey and the work that he's done and how he got there and, and what he aspires to do moving forward. But I do just want to say a little bit in the way of introduction. So it's a lot, but so I'm going to kind of uh, just move through it quickly. I'm going to try to, it's all good, so I really don't want to overlook anything. But so um, I call him Ty. He's my colleague. I'm a program director down in um, University College in the, pub, the undergraduate public administration program there. Ty is a program director also uh, for both the community development and the healthy communities programs. And he was instrumental in starting a graduate certificate program in community development. And so um, I'm going to let him talk about some of the things that he's done recently, including um, bringing some resources, some grant money to, to those programs. But I'll, I'll say that, um, that Ty earned his doctorate in educational leadership. Um, his work over a number of decades has focused on community and economic development, urban education, and neighborhood revitalization. Um, he has received numerous state and national level awards for his professional accomplishments, as well as his role as a community activist. So today he's going to touch upon um, community engagement and he's going to focus on why it's important to have proximity to the issues that you're advocating for and making decisions about. So whether it's serving on a board of directors, being involved in a group like this, uh, RIASPA leading an organization, or representing constituents in public office, you have proximity to the issues you're making decisions, and, and this is what truly uh, enables us to have impact for the work that we do. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Ty to come forward and talk about the entire ecosystem of critical socioeconomic systems and structures, that's a lot, uh, to better inform change through policy and practice. Basically, he's gonna talk about his journey. So welcome, Ty. Katrina. Uh, so first, thank you uh, to RIASPA, uh, the MPA program, the leadership program, uh, Dean Bronson School uh, uh, Justice Studies uh, for having me. Um, so when Dr. Hall asked me to speak about civic engagement, I kind of had the back and forth like Katrina did between civic and community. Uh, and differentiating the two. Uh, and I, I, it's interesting because I have a pretty interesting relationship with the term, um, as I was even tackling it last night at a, a committee I sit on, uh, which I'll speak about in a second. But um, what I do know is that whatever you call engagement, um, your effectiveness is tied to proximity. Um, and that, that concept has become critical for me uh, over the last year. Actually, really resonated with me when I heard uh, Brian Stevenson talk, who is the author of Just Mercy, um, which the uh, Rhode Island Council for Humanities hosted in here. Uh, and in his speech, 
which is essentially a synopsis of his book and the reason why he gets into, why he got into uh, criminal justice defense for the wrongfully accused is because he had proximity to the issues as an attorney um, in the Deep South. And so when you are entrenched in an environment like the Deep South, uh, and practicing criminal defense law, in particular for those who have been wrongfully accused. Uh, that's, a, that's a very unique setting to do work in and gives you a totally different perspective. Um, so proximity matters. So if you take one thing away today, after you ate that food and try to stay awake, and some of you who are trying to have me extend time so you don't have to go to class after this, <laughs> uh, proximity matters. If you take one thing away from that. And so uh, I just want to talk about how my pathway into the, the madness that is my world today uh, came about and why proximity has kind of risen to the top for me in terms of how I, how I operate. So essentially my career started out in urban education. I worked uh, from New York City, uh, the Bronx in particular. And yes, I'm a Yankees fan, and yes, I'm sour about Boston. <laughs> um, but I worked in a public school, PS48, in Washington Heights, um, predominantly Dominican community. Uh, the school was 98% Dominican. The teachers were 98% not Dominican. Um, but uh, they were uh, severely engaged in their community. In fact, on my first day there, uh, the teachers who are not from this community told me where was the best place to get mofongo uh, because the students' parents worked there. They knew the best place to get this, to get that in the community. And then I realized that the principal uh, had her professional development tied directly to what, where our kids come from, what they experience on their walk to and from work. Uh, was much more important than the pedagogy by which uh, they taught in a classroom or test scores. So that to me was profound in how they practiced their craft. Uh, but in that work, I realized, you know, I try to do everything I can for young people in schools, after school programs, working with young people who dropped out, uh, but it's bigger than that. It's their housing, it's their health, it's their, uh, their living conditions, the stable uh, family, mom or dad, somebody's in jail. It, you know, it's all of these other social determinants. And so what I was doing in this very narrow focused way uh, that I thought was like the way, this was my pathway, was not enough. Uh, and I'm not satisfied with not enough. So I went back to school. Uh, I got my master's and uh, started a nonprofit to help high school dropouts reintegrate them back into education. As I was doing that, um, I realized it's not enough um, because to get them back into education is to assume that they have the time to not work, right? Um, to get them back into education means that they have to take money out of the table, take an income out of the home, uh, and I don't have something to supplement that. So it wasn't enough. By this point, my wife, who was a psychiatrist, was uh, accepted to medical school in Syracuse, New York. So I went to Syracuse um, and worked for Syracuse University doing a, a community revitalization initiative in the near west side of Syracuse. So now I come knowing Education is not enough, uh, and we can't just rebuild communities and not think of all these social determinants. Um, now I'm in the ground. I'm the guy between Syracuse University and the city of Syracuse who had a very, very uh, poor relationship with the university because they were the ivory tower on the hill that never engaged with the community. So you can go to Syracuse University and never step outside of campus, right? and not know that Syracuse University per capita has the largest population of uh, child poverty in the Northeast. Or that Syracuse University has one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in New York and it's the fifth largest city. Um, so you don't know those things if you just go to Syracuse University and you leave, right? So now they're trying to expand into the community. It's my job to broker that, right? Now, I'm not from the inner city of Syracuse or the inner city of Pover uh, Providence, uh, but I'm from an inner city, right? So poverty looks the same everywhere. Poor housing looks the same everywhere. Joblessness looks the same everywhere. Trauma looks the same everywhere. Uh, it's just a certain different set of variables. So because I came from that, I have a different perspective in the work, right? So there's a very foundational level of proximity, my lived experience. 
uh, but now I'm raising my educational level, I'm getting a bigger awareness, I'm getting more woke, I'm seeing more things. And I describe where I am now as Neo when he's unplugged from the Matrix and sees the world in ones and zeros and like everything is really ugly. That's, the, that's what I feel right now and where I am and I'll explain why that is. Uh, it's a good and a bad thing, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, but this pathway led me to realize that uh, what I was doing on the ground to revitalize a community meant I need to have the private businesses on board, the health center on board, the bank on board, the neighbors on board, the university on board. And what this work taught me was that I'm an amazing ego manager. <laughs> and when you are bringing people together, when you are trying to organize a collective effort, uh, especially as the organizer, you, can, you have to have the smallest ego in the room. And you'll be surprised how much you'll get done when you're willing to give other people credit, right? And so when you are able to remove yourself from a situation like that, then all of a sudden things start coming together. Then you become less threatening, people trust you, and they know that, oh, well, working with him actually makes me look good, right? And so these are things you learn along the way. I was now in my doctorate program, there was not a course on this kind of stuff, okay? Um, so these were things I learned in the field. I knew in the field that nonprofits fighting for the same funding in a small city with a small pot of money is cutthroat. So it's interesting though because at the same time as I work with nonprofits, I think to myself, again, I come from the street, right? And I think about drug dealers I remember on my, on my neighborhood if somebody new came into the territory, it was a problem. And I think about this now. I'm at working in nonprofit management, I'm director of operations, running a grant. I ran uh, the YWCA in Syracuse uh, for a couple of years before I went into Syracuse University. So we had a, a women's shelter, uh, girls inc incorporated youth programs, uh, teen pregnancy prevention stuff. And I'm in grant meetings and I'm getting side eyes and things like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a cutthroat world. So those kinds of learned lessons. Now, yesterday I was on a review committee for uh, Tufts Health Foundation. And so we're putting out $10,000 grants into the community and I had to review the proposals as part of a collective team. Now I'm sitting at the table thinking to myself, I know we set up nonprofits to fail, right? Nonprofit Quarterly sends out a, a, a review every year. The top th like 30% nonprofits, Salvation Army, Boys and Girls Club, Rescue Missions, the largest nonprofits nationally, at a minimum have 40% of their budgets from federal and state grants. So if those big boys and big girls are not sustainable on their own, how can the small college access or the after school tuition program, right? So now I'm at the table deciding who gets money. So now let's can you envision how I'm, I'm processing this versus somebody who has never actually had to repurpose folders, had to count staples because we don't know when our next grant money is coming in, or had to deal with staff or deliver the message to staff, I don't have your paychecks this week, right? So that's a totally different dynamic when you're sitting at the table reviewing grant applications now, having lived at the point where my paycheck I wasn't getting this week. And then having to give that message, and then now being the source of the pipeline for that money to either cut that check or not. Now that's the reality of our nonprofits at the ground level doing the heavy lifting, right? So that kind of perspective changes how you operate in things. And so as I became, as I, as my trajectory came here, so my wife is a psychiatrist, right? And the way we ended up here was, first of all, she came to visit uh, uh, Brown where she did her medical residency, um, and I had never been this far up 95 before. <laughs> so I have an aunt that lives in Boston, but I didn't stop in Providence. So I was experiencing Providence and Rhode Island. Drove the whole state, which you can do in an hour, which is great. But <laughs> it was beautiful to me. You had the ocean, you had the country, you had an urban core, you had so much diversity, you had the whole world in one small state. And that was beautiful to me. But uh, like I said, my wife and I were both from the Bronx. She's half El Salvadorian, half Dominican. Both of her parents are immigrants, no college degree, barely any high school. Uh, and she's a psychiatrist. So she had no uh, guidance or anything, right? And so now, we come from the world of community-based work, 
uh, but she's a mental health professional. So our world around health has really been around trauma-informed care and thinking about uh, the impacts of trauma on, on people in urban communities. So we, she interviews, I'm driving the whole city uh, and state. I pick her up at the end of the day and I'm like, I love it here. It feels like a little New York. I ended my day driving down Broad Street in Providence and it felt like Ford Road in the Bronx. There were people outside, the music was loud, it was great. Spanish food, salons, barbershops, I felt like I was back in New York. I was like, this is great, I can see us, I can see us here. And she was like, uh, I don't think it's gonna work out. I was like, why? She was like, well, I finished the day with the director and he said, uh, I don't think you're gonna like it here because you're from New York and we don't have a diverse patient population. So I said to myself, oh, okay, so we definitely have to move here because uh, I know what I do and what she does in the world of medicine mental health, a Latino psychiatrist, Spanish speaking, um, in a state that's gonna be predominantly Latino in less than a decade, uh, that you can count on one hand with Latino psychiatrists. I said, you're that gatekeeper, you're that bridge. And I know I can set up the community side, so you tee up the medicine side and we can do some really great stuff. So, um, so that was indicative to me of the world of psychiatry's proximity to the communities of Providence or lack thereof. And in a world where we are dealing with me mental health and behavioral health from all sides of the coin, uh, that's a very critical uh, bridge that was not there, right? And so that led me to say, okay, we need to come here and we move here. So we did. I started networking everywhere. And I was in every space, every room. I was reading the newspaper, who are the community advocates, quoted on events, where's the crime happening, I'm mapping it like a stalker, looking on Google Maps to concentrate the communities, seeing where development ha is happening, where's the poor housing stock, where are anchor institutions located in the state, that's what I geek out over. So I'm now doing a landscape of who's who, what's what, where's what. And so I thought, at this point in the game, I know proximity matters, uh, I just didn't have it that, that defined yet. So my decision was, let me test this out. Let me see how well I can know an entire ecosystem in a state that I think I can potentially at least try and wrap my arms around. And so this is essentially what it looks like. I'm gonna try and say this without having a panic attack. <laughs> so uh, I chair the Health Commission for Advocacy and Equity. It's a state legislative commission. It's called the Rhode Island CHE, Commission for Health Advocacy and Equity. This commission, it's a state commission, we meet every month, public meetings, um, studies and addresses health disparities in the state of Rhode Island, and we make policy recommendations to address those health disparities. Uh, but also what we do is we align with pre-existing legislation, right? So for example, we just had a $15 uh, minimum wage act, right, that got tabled. Um, and the Commission for Health Advocacy and Equity knows that if we're gonna address health disparities like, say, uh, infant mortality or low birth rates, we know that low birth rates are linked to access to prenatal care. We know that people who don't seek prenatal care have a certain level of education or a certain level of access to prenatal care. So if we address potentially education as a strategy, we would in turn, the ripple effect would be addressing infant mortality rates. So, or if we knew if we increased income in people's, in people's you know, uh, homes, then they would have the luxury of buying a bus pass or getting, saying I, don't, I can't go to work today, I need to take a, because hourly people, you don't work, you don't eat. So if I don't work, I know I have enough money to take an hour or two off work and go to the doctor, right? And there is how you turn over those rates. So there's the $15 an hour bill, uh, let's support it as the health commission. We can say as a table of collective experts, if you address $15 an hour, uh, you will address unintentionally, but unbeknownst to you, infant mortality rates, maternity child health disparities, things like that. So those kinds of connections are not what people necessarily see, right? But in this commission, we have the ability to not only make that announcement, but 
put a stake in the ground and say, we're the health experts. Um, so if you don't believe us, then who, right? And this makes economic sense, it makes financial sense, it makes population health sense. So that work connects me to an ecosystem of players and people who had no idea existed, right? So one of those things is something called the SIM Committee. Has anybody ever heard of the state innovation model, SIM? Okay, a couple. So basically this is a, the state won an award to rethink Medicaid. Essentially, this is a table of people with health insurance companies, hospital heads, health care heads in the state who are making the decision on what is covered or not covered under Medicaid. How to restructure billing, like uh, what we, what's billable and things like that. And I'm sitting at this table thinking to myself, wow, so these kind of tables are where these decisions are made, right? Um, and all of these players are around the table. And so, I could go on and on in this, in this room, but I'm gonna stop there because this is a long list of things I gotta talk about. So, uh, so that commission gave me insight into this world, right? And I'm gonna talk about another piece um, after I go through this list because it kind of tees up the next part, but I also chair this, the board for uh, the Academy for Career Exploration Charter High School, which is one of the first charter high schools. It used to be Textron Chamber Charter High School in the West End, my vice chair is sitting right here. Um, I chair this, the Providence Student Union Board uh, because my career has been with young people and if there's an entity who's representing young people, especially in a unionized format, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in. So uh, as we started st structuring the Providence Student Union in a very formalized, sustainable way, I agree to chair that board. It's connected to all of the work I do, especially providing young vo uh, voice to young people. I sit on the board with some board members here for the West Elmwood Housing Development Corp. We are a nonprofit CDC. One of our most recent developments is the Sankofa Project, which is a $60 million development with a social enterprise, a commercial kitchen, a community garden in the West End of Providence. Uh, it's over 50 affordable units. Um, and we're working on a major project right now, which we've announced that it'll essentially be a college campus housing early childhood center for uh, parents in Rhode Island who are matriculating college students to completely remove barriers to access. I want you to worry about nothing but going to college as a parent trying to attain a post-secondary credential. So look out for that. I sit on the board for the YMCA. Uh, which is a statewide board for all of the chapters, and we are in the process of uh, expanding our presence in Providence as the capital city, as we should be. Um, and that comes with its own uh, rewards, if you want to call it that. Uh, I sit on the board for Grow Smart Rhode Island, which is essentially the policy and research and practice institute for how to use, uh, how to smart how to develop cities in a very smart equitable way right that makes sense in policy makes sense in the way trends are moving um, i sit on the governor's workforce board's education and employment advisory council um, the swear center at brown's advisory board okay uh, the new leaders council i serve on or was a board member and served on their curriculum committee now i was on their curriculum committee because the New Leaders Council runs a semester-long fellowship that kind of mirrors a practicum development course. And so what we do at Roger Williams University College, we do something called standardized credit documentation, and we vet programs, training programs, and things like that for uh, college credit. So they do a community development project, they have a capstone, they actually deliver it. And so they're a national organization. We did an entire audit of their program and awarded credit. So once I built that relationship, my work with NLC had been served. And so I stepped down and made space for somebody else to take a, a leadership role. Uh, I sit on the advisory council for our reentry campus program that works with men and women who have come home from prison who are seeking a post-secondary degree. And what has been most interesting for me, uh, again, going back to that health commission, is a, an appointment to the governor's overdose task force. And this is where proximity hit home for me. 
I mentioned I'm from the Bronx. I'm from 169th and Washington Avenue in the South Bronx, Governor Morris Projects. Uh, about six huge high-rise buildings. I grew up there in the 80s, during the height of the crack epidemic, okay? And so my first day in the Governor's Overdose Task Force, I'm sitting there, and everybody's introducing themselves, and I'm thinking to myself, A, with exception to the Director of Health, Dr. Alexander Scott, I'm the only person of color around this table. I'm here by way of the health commission that I chair, not because of my professional role. So everyone else around the table are hospital heads, insurance heads, uh, and state department heads. And so I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is an overdose task force when people were dying in my community for decades, still are. I'm thinking to myself, uh, everybody's going around introducing who they are and what they hope to bring to the uh, overdose task force. So I reply and I say, um, or my turn comes, and I say, you know, my name is Taino Palermo. I represent the Health Commission. I work at Roger Williams. And I'm hoping to provide some perspective to the group. I grew up in the Bronx during the 80s, and uh, no one cared about addicts. I remember public health messages at the bus stop waiting for school that said, watch where you step so you don't step on a needle. And I'm thinking to myself, here at this table, how much we care about addicts. And why is that? Because addicts started uh, dying in droves at different hues, at different socioeconomic statuses. And as a community guy, I get it, I'll take attention on, on community issues, health issues, any way I can get it. But I would be remiss to be at this table. This is still my intro, okay? I would be remiss to be at this table and not bring light to the fact that our policies and actions happen when it starts to affect us, okay? When CEOs' kids are dying and not the public housing kids, then it's an issue, okay? And so, again, I'll take the attention any way I can get it because they, they all of those lives matter to me. Uh, but let us be very clear about how and why we move, and let's own that. So I felt bad for the person who had to introduce themselves after me. <laughs> but the point is, is proximity, okay? I had a platform, I had a table, I had a seat at the table, right? You hear that phrase, if you don't get a seat at the table, you're on the menu, right? And so I never had a perspective of what I could potentially, you know, I don't know how that resonated with folks. I don't know who took that home and said, damn, he's true, bless you. I don't know if that's, you know. So I don't, so the point is though, is that that was the platform that needed it, that need, it had to be set, right? So the point is, is proximity to all of this is that I, when I grew up, we criminalized addicts, right? And now I saw a commercial early yesterday that you know, was a, there was always commercials for addictions and you know, if you need help, call this number. But I thought, wow, it said, if you need help, call this number. And also, your health insurance might cover this as well. If you have private health insurance, you are fully covered. I thought to myself, wow. <laughs> so now, remember the SIM committee. Now we're talking about what we're covering, what's billable, right? Now we're talking about billable substance abuse recovery coaches. You know, we, uh, the, uh, the ACI was one of the few uh, 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 prison system that didn't serve methadone, so you couldn't uh, detox in the prison. And so you literally had zombies who picked up, who you picked up off the street as, a, as an addict and dump them in a prison, and they're not given any me method to wean off of this drug, right? And then you reintegrate them into the society, into society by which they place them in the ACI to begin with. So I think one of the most profound elements in this overdose task force thing for me was that, again, my wife is a psychiatrist now, so she's in her residency program. And so one of the first things they tackled was a prescription monitoring system. So Rhode Island has a prescription monitoring system. Every physician who writes prescriptions it gets tracked and, and, um, and monitored. At its inception, it was an opt-in system, right? So when the task force started, they did an analysis and saw that only 20% of the physicians that could write prescriptions in the state were actually opting into this. So I thought to myself, why would, why would it be opt-in when the opioid crisis is affecting New England the most 
affecting Rhode Island and New England the most per, per capita. So I'm sitting at the table, and all of a sudden, they say, all right, Joe, this next subcommittee, you do this, you do that, boom, 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 boom. Next month, we report back. Came back next month, they said, okay, we're going to roll out 100% mandate on boom, 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 boom. The next month, I'm cooking dinner, and my wife's looking through her email. She's like, oh, man. I was like, what? So I got 30 days to register uh, with this monitoring system. Otherwise, we can't go to our next clinical system. And I just stopped. And I thought to myself, wow, that's how that happens. It's not always running for office. It's not always uh, being on, city, on the city council or being the mayor or the governor or the state rep, right? It's being active and engaged in all of these things. I am not part of all of these things because I love to go to meetings. <laughs> I hate it. But if I'm not at those tables, then my community doesn't have a voice. If I'm not at those tables, I can't say, okay, what you're, what you're proposing right now looks like this in action, right? When we were at our old building, 150 Washington Street, uh, some of the, we had some folks from the health department come. I think uh, Juan back there, you might have been there. The health department folks come from diabetes prevention, right? And they're like, how do we best get to uh, the community which is, you know, uh, struggling with diabetes and, and chronic disease? And I'm like, well, uh, I think we were meeting to, to uh, potentially pilot, like, putting monitors in bodegas and, and salons and barbershops where people congregate to share information there. So as we're talking this out, they're like, yeah, because, you know, we just want to get this information out. Look, we got this great pamphlet. And I looked at the pamphlet. And it was, it was all these words. It was so small. They were like, look, there's a great fun game on the back. And I said, do, do you think that... Who do, you, who do you anticipate this, who's, like, where is this going to go? Whose hands is this going to go into? And when they described the population, I had, it became abundantly clear that you will never succeed in what you're trying to do because you don't know where you need to be. You know who you need to serve. You don't know how to serve them. And so uh, those kinds of things are things where we can help inform. As you are in your professional settings, uh, students and alum, my colleagues here, you know, we know that what matters is how much we are affected by the decisions we make. And I think if you are at a decision-making table in any professional capacity or even personal capacity, your immediate rubric, your litmus test should be, <laughs> does this decision affect me? And if it doesn't, who does it affect? and I need to run that decision by them first, okay? And I say, it sounds arduous, but I'm telling you, if what you are doing is also followed up by programming, it has to be measured and, and seen as effective and all that, if you make a decision in silo, if you enact a policy or legislation and initiative without being participatory in nature, without being collective in nature, it's acting like you're serving somebody when you're just, uh, uh, exoticizing them, you will fail at what you do. And you are not in the business of community engagement and civic engagement and authentic practice. And, and I'm saying that straightforwardly. And if we were at a table together and that happened, I would say it's you at that table, because I'm that guy, right? <laughs> and so the point is, is that if we're gonna make decisions about people's lives, you know, you public administration folks, leadership folks, you will be at those tables if you're not already there. It's about proximity, and will you understand the impacts of the decisions you're making? You know, part of the problem with what we're working on in Providence is that there's so much development in a city like this, you can't, it's hard to track it, it's hard to mitigate it. But what's happening is decisions are being made and people see the uh, repercussions of those decisions in the rear view mirrors as they drive out of the communities that they make decisions for. So if I leave you with one thing, just don't be those folks. <laughs> and so I'm going to stop there so that people can have uh, time for class. Yep, not yet. No. But I'll leave it open. If, I don't know if we're doing questions or anything no, like that. I just wanted to say, if, you know, we always like to make sure we have time to give you a voice in our um, sessions. And so if you have questions for time, um, anything at all that has to do with the uh, 
well, anything that he's talked about, or anything at all that he feels reasonably comfortable in answering, um, please ask the questions. <laughs> We're colleagues. I'm pretty close. He's used to that. So, um, yeah, don't be shy. Great. So you told a story about where you started and your wife, and her parents came to another country and she had no guy. What's your story though? Like what, so you were in the Bronx and the projects, like, I can't imagine what you saw around you, but obviously you probably made it a lot farther than the people that you came up with. What, mm -hmm. what was your motivation? Um, I, I, for me, it was, I think it was just a set of uh, fortunate circumstances. I'm an outlier. Um, where I'm from, statistically, is not supposed to be here in front of you guys, mm -hmm. such as the case with my wife. I, I, if I knew, I'd probably package it and be making a lot of money in, in the urban community, but I, it, I'm, I'm not even joking. It's, it's a series of fortunate circumstances. Everyone I grew up with is either dead or in jail, or were just Facebook friends. Like, I can't even go hang out. You know, it's like the sort of the fellows like that. I mean, serious. <laughs> and so part of the thing is also, though, uh, it's a blessing for me, though, because it allows me to flow it through circles. You know, I, I, I can do this here and speak to all of you, uh, but uh, Tuesday I was uh, at the barbershop on Broad Street talking to my Dime lo loco, que lo que, in, in front, you know, in a loud bar. So, that, and if, you know, if I'm on the weekends, I'm in t-shirts and showing, I'm tatted up all here and all my arms and everything. That ability allows me to float through those different environments. So I can't answer the question about how I got here aside from I was nudged in the right directions by the right people. There were triggers that, that there were pivotal, not triggers, pivotal points uh, that I can specifically point to. Like the first time I tutored a young kid in undergrad uh, who didn't think that I was in college because I looked the way I looked, right? And I reminded him of his brother who sold dope. And so that was profound to me because I was like, whoa, yeah. this, this person can't even envision I am where I am. And I'm going through my own identity stuff, like, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, as a first generation college student. Uh, but then I was in college and I met the first person of color, I was a TRIO student, so I was in a, a student support program for first generation college students. I met the first person of color in the leadership position I'd ever seen before. And that was profound to me. I wanted to be him. And then he empowered me and showed me, you know, broke down the false narrative of the communities I grew up in and was, you know, indoctrinated to believe. And I realized anything was possible. And by that point, now I was just setting myself up and investigating my interests, you know? So uh, I was fortunate, and I listened to the signs. I can't say that for everybody, you know? Other questions? What nationality are you? I'm Puerto Rican. There you uh, um, So as someone, uh, personally, who cannot seamlessly navigate uh, the community that needs more help, um, how would you suggest getting closer to that community and better understand? It's all about ambassadors. You don't need to be from my community to be able to help my community, right? I'm not from Providence, but my integration into Providence, if you remember, I said I researched who's doing what, right? I can't show up like, hey, hey, hood, I'm from the hood. Let's <laughs> trust me, right? I can't do that, right? So I need to find the gatekeepers. I need to find the ambassadors. I need to find the grandma on the block that knows everything. And she's the one who says, Ty is good. Ty is one of us, Ty believes us, right? And so I, I speak to, uh, every year I speak to the state police cadets on, uh, on community police relations, right? And I get that question every year. It's like, you know, if I'm driving to the South Side and I wanna hop out and play ball with somebody, and people are like, oh, look at them talking to the police. What do I do with that? I said, so go over there and talk to the people who are like, look at him talking to the police. And you talk to them, right? And so once you start breaking down those barriers of trust or distrust, anything is possible. But you'll set yourself up for failure if you just abrasively enter a community and not go through the proper channels. And those channels are social assets. Those are gatekeepers, ambassadors. Uh, who will co-sign for you. Do you identify as a systems thinker? Uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, I kind of see things at the 50,000 foot view, but I live at the ground level. Um, and so, uh, sometimes, you know, it's frustrating. 
uh, being at the 50,000 foot view table with people who are never at the ground and don't know what this looks like in practice or in implementation. Um, but it has become, whether I wanted it or not, to be a, 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 a lens by which I, I view everything. It is the systems, a systems approach. And because of that, I, I usually look at issues with a root cause analysis type of mindset. It's just a why, 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 why. Oh, that's why. They're not coming to school because there's no housing. They're not coming to their doctor's appointment because the RIPTA schedule doesn't work. They can't get a second shift job because there's no bus lines that go at night. So, yes, I mean, what happens is, is as I keep saying this isn't enough, this isn't enough, and I keep getting a bigger and bigger perspective, I'm getting a bigger, bigger sense of the system and the ecosystem. Um, and once you get to that level of extent of like perspective, it's just hard to get out of that mindset because everything is systematized. And we How don't do see you it. Keep that from like, like overwhelming the action steps. Um, it's it's hard. It's hard because I'm not the only one at the table, right? And I'm not the only variable that can move a system. Um, and and so it, it, I can't answer that question with a global response. It's nuanced and it's uh, it's specific. Um, and so that's why it becomes frustrating because sometimes I'm at tables where they're like, oh, I remember we talked about this six years ago. We put together an action plan. I'm gonna try and find it so we can so we don't start from scratch as we're starting from scratch, right? And so uh, and then to do what to create another action plan that somebody else will dig up, right? So. Um, it can get frustrating, you know. Um, at the beginning, uh, you or Dr. Bell mentioned that you have a certificate program or some program in community development. How do you see that? I, I'd be curious to know how that program is laid out and will it integrate somehow with leadership and public administration? Mm -hmm. At least a course of some sort? Well, yeah, this yeah. is fantastic. Well, we cross list a lot of our courses. Um, they teach in our program, we teach in theirs. So, uh, it is already integrated that way, um, and the nature of the community development courses and, pra and programs are taught by practitioners, um, one of which is here with a class, um, and everything is tied to the field is our classroom. And so, uh, for example, we have a student working with, uh, I was on a call today with Newport, who won a uh, Working Cities Challenge grant by the Boston Fed. And uh, they're trying to figure out how all of these community-based organizations in Newport who service the same people can have one, a user-based uh, data sharing system. So if you go to Boys and Girls Club and your name is John Doe, and then you show up for SNAP benefits, I can just look up John Doe and I know you go to, your kids go to Boys and Girls Club after school. Uh, you seek, you know, this kind of health care at this health care clinic. And so all of us as community-based organizations serving you <clears throat> surround our database around you as opposed to us having our own data system for you in four different places. That's, that's hard to do for community-based organizations who don't have the ability to be data analysts, data scientists, and track data, yet we... We, we ask for data outcomes and, and reports when we're reviewing their RFPs, right? And so, uh, as, I'm, as I'm on the phone with them, I have a graduate student who's doing research on the utility of data by community-based organizations, why they do it or why they don't. Um, and so this was an opportunity for him to get his hands dirty and actually see it in action, test his thesis hypothesis, and also provide a benefit to a community. So that's kind of the nature of how we do things. I was wondering uh, if you had any advice about time management, because it seems like you're pretty busy. <laughs> and well, yeah, how yeah. do you not lose the quality with everything that you're doing? Um, uh, it's two things. One is, is I understand, which I'm glad you asked that because I forgot to mention that. I understand everything I said is not realistic, okay? It's a very uh, isolated type of situation. Also because I mentioned my wife was in medical school residency. We have no kids. I have the luxury of time and filling that time. 
and it's my passion, so I don't see it as work. Um, it, it is absolutely uh, overwhelming at times. Um, there was a period where I was a slave to my calendar, and I had to start injecting blocks of time to just not be bothered. Um, I had to be active about my uh, mental health and well-being. It's, uh, it's a lot of secondary trauma to deal with uh, burying teenagers, with dealing with uh, working in the prisons, uh, dealing with uh, you know criminal defense folks and struggles and seeing people get evicted and fighting for them in housing court. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of transfer trauma to somebody who already has their own trauma and is re-triggered in many situations. Right, uh, William uh, Parsons, who was killed in front of PCCA, was a trigger for me. A good friend of mine was shot six times and died in my arms in a public park on a Saturday. So when we have few spaces where our kids can actually feel safe, like school, and that's taken away from them, then it makes me re reevaluate all those amazing things that I do. I didn't, I didn't protect William, right? Um, and he had nothing to do with anything. So that, those kinds of things become taxing, you know? Um, but it's also understanding that I see this entire ecosystem. You know, I'm, I'm in the training school with these kids when they get arrested. I know their parents because they're in my classes in the ACI or they come here when they get out. Or I see them in the, in the neighborhood because I'm in the neighborhood too, right? So um, time management wise, it became a situation where I had to actually inject vacations into my schedule. And you ask any of my colleagues, they know I, I travel heavily because when I'm here, I'm in it heavily. Um, and I had to force myself to actually remove myself from the environment. Another critical piece to that is I live outside of this city because I spend 90% of my time in this city. And so I intentionally remove myself from the environment when I lay my head at night. Um, so it is about really what makes sense to you. I understand not everyone can be as engaged as I am, but the point of that uh, obnoxious level of engagement is so that I can understand how all of these elements move and then I can start as I remove myself from these tables putting people in those seats to carry that work forward and expanding the seats at the table as well so I don't plan to do this forever because that's not sustainable but now that I'm here who can I create space for Are you all in the same class and I'm trying to go to Dr. <laughs> 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 yes, okay. I have a question that um, we have some students that have streamed on sure. live because um, they either couldn't be here or we have a lot of remote distant learning students. Mm -hmm. So we do have one from Larry. Um, you wrote first, thank you for your time tonight. My question is, what is one thing you can impact on someone who strives to be the best leader they can be? Mm. So that's from Larry. I think uh, if, if you could do one thing to impact uh, anything as trying to be a leader is to um, understand that in a leadership position, your role, your success is measured by how many people you make successful. It matters not your name recognition, your letters behind your name, Dr. Palermo allowed me access to tables Taino Palermo would not be at. Um, but now that I'm at those tables, I know, like I said, if I leave those tables, there should be two of me there now, right? So I guess the one thing, if you're gonna measure anything about your impact as a leader is how many leaders have you turned, uh, have you converted? Any question? I just want to say thank you for coming in and sharing your story with us. And also, my question is, uh, are you focused only on what I am right now, or are you still working to help in New York? Um, I, I, t I kind of go back and forth with New York, um, Syracuse in particular, uh, because I'm very connected to the work we did there. Um, when I went to Syracuse, uh, being from New York, I realized that there were a lot of uh, Latino professionals, but we didn't have a, our own kind of networking thing for 
Latino professional. So I created the Latino Professional Network of Syracuse, which has over a thousand Latino professionals that created mentoring programs and things like that. That has converted, not converted, it's evolved, it still exists, but has since evolved into the Upstate Minority Economic Alliance, which is Central New York, Upstate New York's first minority chamber of commerce. So I see the ripple effects of work that I've done, and so I come back to help consult, help you know develop from time to time. But that's really it. Most of my work is right here. You mentioned how you're able to you know put on your suit jacket and kind of switch roles when you're in your community with your people versus the role that you play as, as your profession. How do you, like what do you think when you are able to switch those roles to be able to do certain things based off the people that you're with? Um, I think it is uh, um, an innate, uh, something that you just have to learn. It's not formally taught. Um, it is conceptually framed as like code switching, being able to turn on and off certain social behaviors in different environments uh, without being a totally different person. It's like, you know, Ty's great to me, but he's mean when I'm... So I'm still the same person, it's just the delivery method of the message. Um, you know, when I'm at, in the barber chair, my barber doesn't speak English. So, you know, I'm not gonna speak to him A in English and A in big words, you know? And so, um, or at least big English words. So. I know, but I'm not gonna be any way, any different than I, I wouldn't, you know, than I would in any other setting or whoever I'm talking to. So I think part of it is learning, like, uh, maintaining your identity while switching uh, in these different environments and understanding that um, you have to have a contextual awareness of where you are and, and who you're around. And I've been in environments where I've brought those circles together. And so, it's not like I can, you know, say hi to Dr. Norvell and then be like, dime lo doco, get okay, right? And so it's in the same room, but maybe, right? And that's okay as well. And it's also, that she sees how I am with Dorka, Dorka sees how I am with Dr. Norvell, and then all of a sudden, they're realizing that this is happening around them. I actually have a grad student who's doing her research on the, the, the uh, elements of black male success. So she's looking at black men in different uh, socioeconomic groups and defining success as socioeconomic status. And actually asking them a series of, she's working with one of our, uh, one of our faculty, Dr. Ravello, who's a phenomenal, phenomenological expert. I always mess that word up. <laughs> uh, but looking at these innate behaviors that certain black men in certain socioeconomic statuses have to maintain, right, socioeconomic status is usually uh, correlating with the educational attainment, degrees, and so, and so there's a level of awareness, wherewithal, as you rise up in your degree attainment. So what are those elements, those social behaviors, psychological behaviors, conscious or, subcon or un uh, subconsciously, that they're navigating the world? And then pulling out those elements to try and identify exactly what you're asking. So. I'll keep you updated on the research. <laughs> Got a question? Uh, yes, we have uh, Dahlia online. Uh, the question is up in the chat box right behind you. What are some of the difficult decisions you've had to make, and what is your decision-making process? So she asked, what are, the what are the difficult decisions I've had to make, and what's the decision-making process? So, uh, so uh, as somebody who grew up as a Trekkie, because my father didn't go to college, so he loved Star Trek and read science stuff, and, and uh, there's a Vulcan saying that says, uh, stop laughing at me. <laughs> there's a Vulcan saying, don't repeat this to my people on, in, the, in the hood. Just kidding. Just kidding. I probably rap Star Trek. There, there's a Vulcan saying, the needs of the few outweigh, or the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And that's essentially how I have to navigate the world, right? I know I, don't, I can't grow money, so I can't address financial issues. I know I don't run a, uh, my own school, so I can't hand out degrees. And so I know I have to navigate within these systems, and uh, I know I'm not the sole decision maker at the table. So difficult decision. Um, 
I really, it's, it's really hard to point to one. I've had to cut programs. Um, I've had to deliver the news. You're not getting a paycheck this week. Um, as a director of operations, uh, I had to do our executive director's dirty work. Um, and so that kind of uh, knowing what it is to be hungry, knowing what it is to uh, go to sleep without a meal, I know that those impacts. So I guess if I have to deliver a difficult decision, it's not delivering it in isolation. It's also, here's a potential solution. If I can't do this, here's something else. Um, so I try to think of it holistically that way. You we were talking about um, information sharing between community um, organizations. Um, I know there are some very strict privacy um, requirements in a number of industries. Mm -hmm. Health, education. How do you work around those and still allow for um, information? Between? Yeah. So there's a reason there aren't that many models like that, um, and and that was actually the nature of our phone call today. So part of what our our approach at that work is going to be uh, researching models of of like uh, getting over HIPAA and FERPA uh, laws, right? So there's a the electronic medical record system is a, is a is a model. Rhode Island has a system called Current Care, um, where you can opt in, and then all your information is funneled into one thing. So we'd have to unpack that, see what kind of legal elements had to be addressed. Um, I don't know if HIPAA has ever spoke to FERPA, spoken to FERPA, and so medical confidentiality around student confidentiality data. So. That still remains to be seen. Luckily, we happen to have a really good law school here as well, so we have some partners we can, you know, call and, and see how we navigate that space. But um, that remains to be seen, and that's a, an interesting and fun challenge um, because it is uh, going to force people to think differently, right? So, um, is Roger Williams spearheading or a member of this? Um Spearheading it, That's yeah, awesome. quarterback it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, it's it's more um, asking for advice in this, in this situation. So I'm going to give you a kind of a, a recent story, and you're probably familiar with the group Young Voices, mm -hmm. led by Karen Feldman. Yeah, of right? course, yeah. So um, I'm in awe of her work. I recently invited her group to an event that I'm setting up. Um, where like Dr. Alexander Scott's going to be speaking, and I was just so excited and got a grant to pay for it. Said, please come bring all your kids, it's free. And she said, sorry, Diana, it's just not the time. Um, my students are still grieving over the shooting of one of their classmates on the first day of school. So I really appreciate your point about proximity and just thinking about kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and how, how can they think about traffic safety, which right. is the topic they'd be listening to when they're just thinking of, you know, concerned about basic safety, getting to school and, and surviving that. Mm -hmm. How do you break through, you know, the, those real ground level issues and give students opportunities um, at a different level? Mm -hmm. um, so, so the, the simple answer is you bring it to them. That's the simple answer. Um, the hard answer is that, uh, or the, the real answer is also that there is uh, uh, youth engagement, parent engagement, these are antiquated um, themes and philosophies. When your parent population in public schools are, uh, have their kids in the same public school system, when a, a high school student's child is in the same school system's pre-K, We've now closed generational gaps. So grandma's 40 years old, 35 years old, right? So, so parent engagement isn't PTO meetings and bake sales anymore, in the urban cores at least. So uh, when you ask public schools how many mailers get returned home, how many phone numbers still work, right? So to your point, we're gonna worry about their Parsons test scores uh, when there's no lights on at home. So. What we do is we run a youth summit here uh, during spring break. So we know it's spring break, we know the kids aren't doing anything, right? But um, we don't like to adult our way through young people. And so uh, what we do, we had a meeting yesterday, what we do is uh, we poll K 
kids throughout the state. The State Department of Ed helps us, and we poll kids asking one question. If you had to wake up every day doing what you love, what would it be? And we, pull, we go through all of that information and identify workshops that they want to, uh, that we host. Then we identify people who are local, professionals, uh, diverse in all senses of the word, and put them in front of these young people and demystify the process. So, so we have about 300 young people who come here uh, two days during spring break, and we float around downtown from AS220, the library, um, and here and host workshops, give away $1,000 scholarships, iPods, iPads, computer, everything. Um, uh, we have transportation. We pick them up from four sides of town with vans from the YMCA. We remove every single barrier. All you gotta do is show up, right? When all you gotta do is show up, it changes everything. I feed you, I do everything except breathe for you, right? And so we underestimate the barriers, right? How many of us are working adults uh, who are going to school or have gone to school here, right? You got kids, you got life, you got job, you got traffic, right? All of those things. So the, the, we try to meet you where you are in every sense of the word, but that's really the nature of this work. You know? uh, Providence has a Working Cities Challenge grant to address workforce development. Their approach is to bring workforce development into the neighborhoods, not the one stop. Right? So um, it's really about contextualizing it. Man, you got to bring it to them. Uh, as, a, um, as a white heterosexual male that uh, grew up in the suburbs, uh, you know, I have no real proximity to uh, the marginalized people that, that you're talking about. Uh, what is it um, exactly that someone who maybe hasn't seen the struggle and doesn't really understand what is it that these people are looking for in someone like me as an ambassador and an advocate for them? Um, like maybe, I don't know, I'm looking for maybe like a state of mind or some characteristics. Uh, how should I approach a situation where I really have no uh, awareness of how it all goes down but would still like to uh, better it? Mm -hmm. um, the, the immediate answer is uh, identify the point of entry. And so, I mean, you, you asked a pretty broad question, but if it's nuanced down to an issue or a certain element, it goes back to the gatekeeper question. Who's leading this work? You know, it'll be that guy who's just like, just discovered a problem that's been here, right? And so, and like, you're the only one working on it when there's been coalitions and groups, right? So, so you do your homework at the point of entry. And then, as somebody, to your point, which you're describing as, uh, privilege to, to that you bring into that environment, you have to realize how much space you're either taking up or not taking up. Um, and come in, and oftentimes it's shut up first. Just, and that goes not just for you in this circumstance or what you're talking about in terms of your profile, but that just means when you enter a foreign space or a space that you want to integrate to, into, show up and shut up. And let, and soak in the room. You have to, because you don't want to be the one who's like, oh, well, you know what? And you just got there, right? And so um, people need to know that you're not this ambitious person trying to exoticize a situation, exoticize a population. Um, and if there's anything you know that you bring into a situation, like privilege, then you just, you, that's a, a tool for you to figure out how to leverage it, right? You, you just introduce your profile to me as everything a community you want to help doesn't have. Those are the assets you're bringing to them, uh, but you need to integrate it in a way that's like, not a white savior complex, but authentic support and engagement, that's all. And it all happens through a gatekeeper and your point of entry. I think there's another question on the board. Yeah, I <laughs> Richard Dahlia? What are some of the difficult things? I think, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It looked like another one came up. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's a very small token of our appreciation. Um, we don't want to leave you if you can, and we do want to get to the Oh. <laughs> I don't have a nice frame, but. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anybody who'd like to join, yeah. <laughs>
The 10th Annual Public Service and Leadership Conference, which is the, the culminating event for um, our RIASPA program year, is going to be May 1st. It's going to be at the Hilton Hotel, um, just a few steps away, Providence. The theme, uh, we're going to ex uh, expand on what we've been talking about all year around community engagement. Our keynote speaker is Serena Breeland, who is the city manager of Bloomberville, Texas, and also uh, Catherine Kerwin is the Director of Communications of the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence. So I'm not quite sure uh, what Serena Breeland is going to talk about specifically, except I think she's going to talk about the community impact work in her, in her region around um, the engagement work that, that's going on there, and from her vantage point as a city manager. So, yes. Um, Kat Kerwin is also by May 1st will be a brand new Providence City Council. Excellent. Good to know. And we would hope you can all attend that event. Um, again, it's going to be uh, we'll, we'll include lunch, breakfast, anything to get you there. <laughs> yes. What time does the event start? So um, we realize people work, but it's, it's, an, it's actually an all-day kind of thing. We start about 9 o'clock in the morning, okay. um, and we go until about 2 in the afternoon. All right. We do have um, some of our, we have uh, guests from National ASPA that come in in the evening, and some, so sometimes we're, we're able to have receptions and things going on earlier, but those details will be worked out. So we hope you can come, and some people actually take the day off work if they can, and it's, it's a really nice event. We have our high school kids from Tolman and Shea, and they're going to be presenting their work as well. So I'd like to have you all there. So again, thank you so much for coming this evening. And uh, live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs>